Um, yeah, so if you guys want to just grab your seats, we're going to get started in two ticks. Um, so I am very, I'm Rana Fruhar. I am a columnist at the FT, very excited to be doing this panel on Microsoft and um, a case study really in Microsoft and its impact, which we've actually had a fair bit of discussion about already and um, I think is a pretty crucial um, uh, point of understanding um, at the moment. So I have with me an awesome panel to discuss this. Um, I'll just very briefly introduce them. You already know them all, I'm sure. Um, starting with Gary Reback um, at Carr and Farrell, who has been called, I actually looked you up and saw the National Law Journal called you the protector of the marketplace. So that's pretty, that's, that's high praise. Um, to his left, we have Ron Schnell, who is a computer scientist and was the uh, CEO of the organizer that enforced the Microsoft compliance um, uh, with government rulings. And really happy to have a tech person here. I appreciated the earlier comment um, from Laura. And then to the far left, we have Bob Topol from the University of Chicago, who is an economics professor and whose opinions will be different than Gary's, I would imagine. <laughs> um, so um, we'll get started. I, we're gonna do our seven minute presentations, have some question time, and I wanna leave a lot of time for you all because I think we should you know, kind of go where the energy is. There's been a lot of lines of discussion and I wanna have a lot of questions if possible. So um, Gary, let's start with you. Can you hear me in the back? Can people hear me in the back? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple things that the Microsoft case bequeathed us before you even get to the question of what the opinion stands for. And I'm going to talk about that in the context of a question a lot of people have asked, including, uh, as I understand it, Luigi himself, which is why didn't the Google trial generate nearly as much public interest as the Microsoft matter did? And the short answer is spectacle. Um, the Microsoft matter went on for years and was long on spectacle. The Google trial, not so much. Now, the business trust that covered the Google trial really did a great job, but there was perhaps 50 times, 60 times the press surrounding the Microsoft matter. In the time I have, I'm only going to be able to give you a brief flavor of uh, what happened. Um, so, uh, in 1993, the head of the antitrust division, Ann Bingaman, took over a deadlocked FTC investigation of Microsoft, and in 1994, Bingaman literally broke into regularly scheduled network programming to announce a settlement with Microsoft in the form of a consent decree that she said would solve all of our problems. The proposed settlement was widely trashed in Silicon Valley and elsewhere as being too narrow because it only focused on one thing Microsoft did and as being totally ineffective. So from the beginning, Microsoft was not just about antitrust. It was about hypocrisy in government. And we knew we needed more than a case. We knew we needed a campaign. Now, there's something called the Tunney Act, and the Tunney Act requires the Department of Justice to get sign-off from a federal judge when DOJ settles an antitrust case. And as luck would have it, the judge assigned to the case was uh, a judge named Stanley Sporkin, who was even more skeptical uh, of the settlement than uh, we in Silicon Valley were. He scheduled a public hearing on the settlement, which really had never been done before, and he invited interested parties to submit briefs. I had clients who were very concerned about Microsoft. I mean, who in Silicon Valley wasn't? Uh, they wanted to submit a brief, but they were afraid of retribution from Microsoft. And so we submitted a 100-page brief opposing the settlement and the name of anonymous amici, which you're entitled to do under the Tunney Act. Now, the anonymous part engaged the fanciful imagination of the press. Political cartoons began to depict my clients as hooded horsemen in the night. This is one uh, from uh, Computer World. And so we had the beginnings of our spectacle. Now back to the brief for just a second. You see that we prominently featured on the cover the economists involved. I've never done that before or since. Uh, why did we do that? And this is really important. In 1985, Carl Shapiro and Michael Katz published a very important model in the American Economic Review about standardization and network effects. And that was followed the next year by a complementary model, also in the American Economics Review, by Gar Saloner and Joe Farrell on network effects and predation. Over the ensuing 10 years, those economists and many, many others 
published a lot of great work on network markets, and none of it was reflected in antitrust jurisprudence. Not cited, not mentioned. Antitrust was stuck in price theory. Can you imagine dealing with a software case and not understanding at least the rudiments of network effects? So it was easy for us to tell the judge, they want you to sign off on this settlement, and they won't even tell you how the markets work. OK, so as luck would have it, the Washington Post had a tech writer who had been an editor of Scientific American. And she knew about this stuff. And she started writing about the new economic thinking. And the Post uh, published it prominently on page one of the business section, occasionally on page one of the Post. So we were representing not only the new technologies, but in effect, the new economic thinking. So we had even more than a spectacle. We had a spectacle with intellectual content. Sporkin held his hearing. This is the CNN courtroom sketch. It's unlike any hearing I've ever been to. The lines to get in rivaled the O.J. Simpson trial. <laughs> a couple of months later, Sporkin wrote an opinion rejecting the settlement with Microsoft, saying it was so limited it only applied on snow days. Uh, this is the banner headline in the Silicon Valley newspaper. Here's Business Week reporting the same thing, but note the difference in the flavor of the coverage. Not like traditional business reporting of just the facts. Uh, the government took an emergency appeal to the DC Circuit, and they reversed Sporkin. This is the headline from the LA Times. Now, at, the, at that time, LA had no tech business. Uh, but the case was so big, it still got banner headlines in the LA Times. And about the same time, Bill Gates noticed that there was something called the internet, and the Silicon Valley startup Netscape was way ahead of him. So he brought down the entire weight of his platform in terms of anti-competitive practices on the startup. And Netscape hired me, but it was clear to everybody that the company had no future unless the government enforced the antitrust laws. So the instructions I got from the general counsel were unconventional in the extreme. I mean, she said, Gary, until the government files a, a lawsuit, you will be the government's worst enemy. And after that, you'll be the government's best friend. And that started essentially three years of almost daily press engagement. About a year into that, we submitted to the DOJ, the, the, I guess, the now famous Netscape white paper that laid out the government's case. In two years after that, the government finally filed suit. The run-up to the trial was a press-feeding frenzy. Here's Time Magazine's press intro uh, <laughs> to the trial. That guy on the right was the head of the antitrust division, Joel <laughs> Klein. So if Luigi and the rest of you want more public interest, I suggest you have John <laughs> Cantor go gallivanting around DC in boxing shorts. Uh, most of you know what happened thereafter. The trial did not disappoint in terms of spectacle. All the bad Microsoft emails, the Gates video deposition, the government won and the decision was affirmed on appeal on the monopoly maintenance count. But then the Republicans came in and they settled with Microsoft under a largely ineffective consent decree. Deja vu all over again. But this time something interesting happened. By the end of the trial, Microsoft had run Netscape out of the browser market. Microsoft had 98% of that market. And this was before smartphones had been invented. So the only way to get to the Google site was to type www.google.com into the Microsoft browser. But if you did that, there was no technical reason why Microsoft had to take you to Google. They could have taken you to Microsoft. Or they could have put up a big red warning that said the Google site was dangerous. It would steal your personal information without telling you, so don't click through. This is a mock-up, but that's the actual Microsoft warning. Had Microsoft done that, it would have killed Google in the cradle, and they similarly could have killed Amazon and Facebook. Few users would have clicked through this kind of warning, but Microsoft didn't do this. And why not? Uh, they were afraid of the bad publicity of further antitrust enforcement. How do I know this? The Microsoft lawyers told me. But you don't have to take my word for it. In 2018, a New York Times reporter interviewed the people involved who confirmed that Microsoft considered the very proposal you see on the screen in front of you. And even the Google people agreed it would have killed their company. 
Uh, so the Microsoft case brought us two important things. I think it mainstreamed network effects modeling and thinking into antitrust law. And it also, frankly, provided us the web we now have with Google, Amazon, Facebook, and even Microsoft. We're not likely to see the kind of scenario that I've just laid out ever again. Uh, the monopolists just won't cooperate. So the remedy in the, uh, the cases that are coming is going to have to be effective. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. Um, OK, uh, we'll move on to Ron. And Ron, I would love it if you could just explain um, exactly sort of what your company did, does, um, how compliance happens in as simple a terms as, as possible, and sort of what you think the impact of all that has been on the, the tech ecosystem in general. Sure. Uh, first of all, it's been unbelievable listening to everybody for the, just for the morning sessions. I mean, I kind of lived through a lot of what was talked about. I, I uh, started on an IBM 360. Um, I was on the ARPANET. I was a researcher on the ARPANET in 1979. Uh, hmm. Consider Steve Wozniak a good friend of mine. I built those mini computer kits. Um, worked at Bell Labs on the Unix operating system kernel. Worked at IBM on their version of Unix, which is called AIX. Worked at Sun Microsystems uh, on their version of Unix, which is called Solaris. And that's where I learned to manage large uh, software development departments, uh, which is what I ended up doing in, in this instance. Um, I, I'm actually an entrepreneur. I had three startups after working at those places. Um, I sold my last startup to a public company in 2000. Thought I was retired for life, and then I got the call from people on behalf of the Department of Justice asking if I'd be willing to do this monitorship stuff. And what, what people don't realize is that there were actually um, three final judgments in this case, consent decrees. There was the US one, there was a New York state uh, group of states, and then the California one that split off. And they were basically, they were mostly all the same until there came a point where they were somewhat bifurcated. But um, they called for the formation of what they called a technical committee. And that technical committee would be made up of three people. The first one uh, would be put forth by the Department of Justice, and that was Harry Saul. Uh, the second one was going to be designated by Microsoft, and that was Franklin Fight. And then the two of them would nominate a third person together, and that third person was Skip Stritter. Now, those three people you know, are and were luminaries in, in the software world. Uh, they went to Seattle with the idea that they would start to do this and realized very quickly they couldn't do it, just the three of them. So they decided, why don't we form a corporation and the sole purpose of this corporation would be to monitor Microsoft. And they brought on seven people, I think, to start with. Um, realized that wasn't enough. Brought on somebody like me who had uh, experience in managing technical people. Um, by the time we were done, I had hired a total of 93 people to run this organization across three offices, two in Seattle area. And um, one, we had to open an office in, in Palo Alto as well because we ran out of people in the Seattle area who were willing to, to do what they considered to be things against Microsoft. So basically what we did was we took the final judgments and used that sort of like our, um, our corporate charter. We would make sure that Microsoft did everything they were required, we were required to do under the final judgments and that they didn't do anything they were prohibited from doing under the final judgments. And what everybody knows about in this case is the, is the browser wars, right? Everybody talks about that, and that turns out to be a pretty simple part of the final judgments uh, that you know, it's very easy to test to see if anyone's getting preferential treatment on the Microsoft Windows operating system because we were all, we were all technical people. That was sort of the unique thing about this remedy. You, don't, you didn't have uh, a lawyer special master who's monitoring this. You had highly technical people. And these, 93 people I ended up hiring over the course of the six and a half years I did this, they were the top technical people in the world, in my opinion. That's why we brought them in. So testing to see if browsers had special treatment was easy. Um, but thing, other parts of the consent decrees, like um, Section 3E, was the most difficult part. So that required Microsoft, in great detail, to document all of their proprietary communications protocols so that third parties 
could build their own servers that could talk to the 93% monopoly of Windows desktops out there. And that turns out to be a really difficult thing. I think it's a lot like the patent uh, requirement of 1956, right? Because this was their proprietary stuff, and they were required to license it, which in Microsoft's case, they had no interest in doing. It was, it was much different. So you have to figure out if this documentation, we had to figure out, is this documentation correct, and is it complete? And it's really hard to do because you know, you're, this has never been documented before by Microsoft. Microsoft was not the type of company that kept good records about their, about their software development. So they were, they were doing this having never done it before. And our role for Section 3E was really to file bug reports against the documentation, which seems like a very kind of tedious and menial job. But you know, we had to look at source code. We had to look at network traffic on the wire and then, uh, in most cases, programmatically compare it to what was, ha what was in the documentation. And we went so far as to take Unix boxes and by sole reference to the documentation, try to build these protocols and then look for things that didn't happen or didn't match the documentation, which worked pretty well for um, errors in the documents, but not, not omissions. So then we had to do things like um, we actually instrumented Microsoft's labs overseas and in China and India and Ireland and captured all of the network traffic that went on during Microsoft's testing. And that we were talking about petabytes of data back in the you know, early 2000s, or mid 2000s rather, um, where you know, those kind of numbers were not generally spoken about. And then we would programmatically compare that network traffic to documents. So it was a, it was a highly, highly uh, technical exercise. And most of the people I hired uh, were hired to do that exercise. Um, now, there are also other provisions that we were responsible for. We were responsible for, for receiving complaints from partners and competitors in Microsoft. And I spent a lot of time uh, actually visiting those partners and competitors and, and, and seeing if they had any complaints. And if they had, you know, check to see if I could verify them and give Microsoft the opportunity to cure. And you know, to me, in, in terms of effectiveness, that was probably the most effective part of the final judgments. If you look at if you're talking about success of this particular remedy, you, you only need to look at Google and, and the success of Google Chrome, right? Because Google realized early on that what, they, what had to happen was that browsers had to be rich in features and functionality. And that was the only way you could compete against Microsoft. Basically, you make Windows, you make the operating system irrelevant. It doesn't matter what operating system you're running. As long as you have access to a feature-rich browser, you can compete with Microsoft. Because you know, today, I mean, I, if I'm not doing coding, I'm in the browser. And I think most of you know, casual users are in the browser most of the time. So the operating system, in my opinion, has become irrelevant. And that was allowed to happen because these strong arming and other techniques that were described in, in the complaint um, were not allowed to happen because Maybe some of it's because of fear of bad press, but certainly we were there. And if it had happened or if it did happen, we would report that to the plaintiffs who would report it to the court. That is so interesting. I have about 10 follow-ups, but we'll, we'll come back to those. Um, uh, Bob, <clears throat> let's move to you. And if you want to lay out what you think the legacy and, and sort of sure. key points are for you. Um, <clears throat> some of you might remember uh, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon a samurai was found dead in the forest, and a group of witnesses for the rest of the movie gave completely conflicting conclusions about what had happened. This might be like that. <laughs> um, so if you could, I have a timeline of stuff. I, I don't control my own slides here, so. Oh, um, do we have a little Here, clicker? Here's a clicker. Yep. Oh, there it is. Okay. Maybe I should hold the clicker. <laughs> yeah, Gary's, Gary will hold it for you, Bob. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Uh, well, I've only got Gary's slides here, so. That's good, they're good slides. Yeah, they're good slides. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, all right. Yeah, I was going to give it one more B. Are we? 
Okay. Um, well, actually, I am going to pull back. In fact, while we're waiting, Ron, I want to ask you just one follow-up. Um, you know, you're obviously a technologist. Um, there's a balance between, and I see this in, in financial markets as well, there's a balance between needing someone with enough expertise to really dig into compliance and to understand what's happening, and yet also having a level of transparency and the ability to sort of translate this to the public, to the press. Um, what lessons do you have for folks that are thinking about algorithmic auditing, how to think about AI? I mean, I, I have to say, even amongst tech journalists that I know, this is a, this is a topic that's really opaque, I think, still. Yeah, it's, it's been a problem for a long time, right? I mean, to find people who are teachers, as I sort of consider myself, and can get down to the bit level when talking about technology, it's hard, it's hard to find those sorts of people, let alone and ma managing other people who are, who are technologists. So, so I, think, um, I think those people are important to find for, for things like this. Um, and, and those are the kind of people who can look at this stuff and create algorithms that, that look for compliance. Um, and and that's, I think that was, that was important in, in this case, to have people who could do that. Mm -hmm. Do we have do we have slides yet, or um, I don't know, Bob? I, do you want to just just want to go ahead and I'll present? Just, I will just wing it um, okay. from this point. Wing it. Here we go. Um, I, I liked Randy's talk because he showed many of the things that I used. Because, like a few of you in the room, I'm old, so I, I, I did my dissertation, the empirical work for my dissertation on cards, and the one thing I can tell you is don't drop the box because you're, you're, you're in big trouble. Uh, then I had that Apple PC, exact one that Randy was showing that sat on my desk when I was an assistant professor. And then, I'll, I'll be okay, don't worry. So, um, then I had the first IBM PC after that. And then perhaps most important for this case, I went down to Best Buy, I got my card, we're down there. And I bought a copy of Netscape Navigator for 40 bucks. Okay, and I brought it home and had a little disks in it and I put it on my computer all. It worked just fine. So over time then, uh, we got involved, my colleague Kevin and Murphy, Kevin Murphy and I got involved in the remedies case. Um, so after the Court of Appeals decision in Microsoft. Um, after that, we ended up working on uh, Caldera, um, on Novell, I mean, it had to do with uh, a applications, alleged anti-competitive acts against WordPerfect, alleged anti-competitive acts that came up in the first Microsoft thing that had the, the remedies that, uh, that Gary was talking about uh, involving DRDOS and so on, and dot, dot, dot down through the years. Um, and I, it, we, we also worked on uh, I wouldn't mention it except for the stuff that came up in the Apple complaint. I, wor I worked on the Apple iPod antitrust litigation, which is kind of a microcosm of what the, the current DOJ complaint is because it was, a, it's a closed, it was a closed garden system for the iPod. And if you wanted to have a real, if you wanted to get your music from real networks, well, sorry, mm -hmm. it's a closed garden. And that, was, that went to trial out in, you know, many years ago now. Uh, but it was a unanimous jury's verdict in favor of, of Apple at the time. And the, and, but the real reason I mentioned it is when I saw the Apple complaint, I had worked on all these Microsoft cases. I worked on that iPod case that the Apple complaint says is not, well, the iPod wouldn't have happened, but for the Microsoft case. And I thought, well, I worked on both of those cases. I didn't know that. I still don't know that. So, um, um, so in one of those, so sometimes I was the testifier, sometimes I wasn't. One of, my, one of the most fun testifying things about this was, you know, if you look at the long list of cases, none of them after, um, uh, after the, the remedies case actually went to trial because Microsoft settled them all. And part of the reason was that they wanted to settle them all. I was at a mediation out in Redmond and the, the, the other side came in with a number that was just fanciful about, you know, a miracle happened or, or a miracle would have happened. We would have made all this money, but for you, you charge us a couple of bucks more for the operating system. And I said, you can't, the, the mediator was rolling his eyes. And I said, you can't give that number. 
And the Microsoft GC with us said, let me make a phone call. And he came back and I said, well, what did he say? He said, he said if there's one thing we have around here, it's money. And so they, they settled the case. Um, later on, I got to be, it, I had to become familiar with all the, the details of all these Microsoft cases or the, the plaintiff's arguments. Because they all, after these settlements, they all came together in the state cases. And the state cases rolled in everything from the trial we're talking about today, or the litigation we're talking about today, and the stuff from previous litigation, searching for some measure of damages because people wanted to, to get some money. So I had to be, we, we did mock trials. I had a dozen juries in front of me, in front of a, in a, uh, in a big auditorium. And I got to be the plaintiff's expert. And so they asked me you know, in front of all these folks, you know, please introduce yourself, professor. And I said, my name is Roger Knoll. Yes, it is. Now, many of you don't know who Roger was, but he was the plaintiff's expert. And then I had to go through the whole litany of all the things that Microsoft had done. Now, when we get to the, when we get to the actual case, I mean, we really haven't discussed here the theory of the case. Um, it's, we've, it's, I mean, you've alluded to it a little bit, but the theory of the case was that uh, either Netscape, Netscape or Java, or the combination of Netscape and Java, could evolve into a middleware platform that would stick a bunch of its own APIs out the top, connect to the APIs of the underlying operating system, and it could be evolve according to the theory to become a competitor to not just uh, Microsoft, but also Apple, which had its own operating system. Now, the long and short of it is, well, that didn't happen. And it didn't happen in a world where it really could happen after the case. So there's no evidence of anything like that ever happening, that these cross-platform cross middleware, pieces of middleware, supported important client resident applications. Just didn't happen. Java, the other piece of this, which is really a better threat. If I can recommend reading to you folks, if you really want to understand this case, you might go back and read uh, Gates's Internet Tidal Wave memo. It's long. Netscape and Java occupy a small place in it. And it's not convincing at all that he had in mind the type of theory that I just articulated. He was concerned about somebody else having the, net, the, the, the browser that was the island, the, the, the bridge across to the other island where the internet was. But he wasn't so concerned about it commoditizing the operating system in the sense that it became, that, that, that language became used in the, in the, in the uh, litigation. The other is you might read uh, the uh, Fisher Rubenfeld versus Evans and Schmalenzi debate in AEI where they both, after, they, after their testimony, laid out their theories of the case and then rebutted each other. It's very informative. Um, and then uh, read the Court of Appeals decision. And then you'll kind of understand what the Court of Appeals decision was about. A, an easy way, a colloquial way to, to describe the case is that Microsoft perceived a threat and it was by and large the boogeyman coming out of the closet but they opened fire with a double-barreled shotgun. And the two barrels of the shotgun had a bunch of X, one, of which, uh, uh, one set of which had to do with restrictions on distribution. The other set of which had to do with investing $100 million a year in improving their, brow their own browser, uh, Internet Explorer, and with charging low prices, the, a price of zero for the browser. Now, the government's case was that, that those two acts that I just mentioned were Predatory. Now, if you think about that in retrospect, the price they charged for the browser was zero. And I had gone down and bought it for 40 bucks. So that was their theory of why you couldn't be charging, making money charging zero for this thing, so it must be predatory. Well, it turns out, as we know from the last 25 years of history, zero is basically the competitive equilibrium price for a browser. They charge the competitive price. And wisely, the Court of Appeals threw out the parts about investment and, pre and predation and kept, um, I don't agree with all of what they kept, but they kept the parts about distribution. 
And then the question comes down to, of those two barrels in the shotgun, which are the ones that really mattered for the distribution of IE and for Navigator? And I think the evidence is compelling. We can't really sit here and go through it all today. That it was really the zero price in investing and making a better browser over time. Okay. One, last, last point. <laughs> la last point. Um, I think the open question, I divided, when I made my slides, I divided them, and it turned out to be the agenda for today. The two questions were, did the acts that occurred at the time affect competition going forward in the way that one might expect from the theory of the case? The answer is, I think, unambiguously no. The second question is, did the case engender the development of new technologies or, or products um, going forward after 1999? And in my view, despite you know, Gary's slide to the contrary, in my view, I think the answer to that is also no. Okay, great. Um, we could stay with this, but I actually kind of want to push you guys bigger and also more forward because this is really not about, you know, relitigating the entire case, but sort of looking at what the lessons are for today. One historical question I do want to ask um, all of you to comment on quickly. This case was happening at a time when there had been uh, a lot of consolidation. There was a lot of deal making um, that had happened. We talked a little bit about why, or Gary, you talked a bit about why this got more publicity than Google, but why was it the case of that moment, do you think? Uh, boy, that's a good question that takes uh, a lot to answer, but to be concise here, you talk about deal making. One of the things I didn't have time to talk about is after the first feeble consent decree, Bill Gates was emboldened and was going to acquire into it which would have given him a huge leap forward in, in banking, in digital banking, which was thought to be the killer app of the internet. And that's really what we were campaigning against as much as Microsoft's other conduct. Uh, I, I can't answer the question. You know, it hit at a point in time when there weren't a lot of other cases going on and because of the spectacle factor, I mean, compared today to the Google trial, I think most people were more interested in, you know, Bitcoin boy and blood drop girl uh, than they were the importance of the Google case. And there really wasn't anything like that going on. And it was a time that we didn't have the kind of international crises we have today. So journalists' attention wasn't, mm. wasn't as attenuated. But that's, uh, I think, anybody's guess as to how you would answer uh, the question. Ron, do you want to weigh on that? Sure. I think, I think Gary was right uh, in his initial statement that there were a lot more fireworks in the Microsoft case than there are in any of these current cases. I mean, Bill Gates came out with fantastical statements like, you know, if the, if the Justice Department does this to us, the entire world will come to a halt because we run the entire world of computers. And then, you know, the, the spectacular uh, failure, you know, ill-advised statements he made at his, you know, deposition uh, with Stephen Houck. I mean, uh, you know, those things, the public cares about those kind of things. It's it's almost like watching a soap opera. Mm. So in terms of publicity, I think that is, has a lot to do with it. Bob, I'd love your thought too, but if you can actually give a little more perspective even beyond the tech industry, if possible, I mean, why was it, because there's there was consolidation in a lot of industries. So why was this the case at the moment? Well, I mean, remember, it was, a, it was a product that everybody was either acquiring or would, would acquire. Mm. And almost all of them, except for a handful of folks who had Macs or who were geeks and had a Linux machine or something, had one of these. And then I think, <coughs> I, I think Ron was right that there was a lot of entertainment value to uh, not just Gates's testimony, but to like the emails, you know, Balmer says we're going to cut off their air supply. And the fact that, you know, th those are the kinds of things that people have in hallway conversations or something like that. It looks like it looks like it's it's consistent with the theory of predatory conduct. It was entertaining stuff. Mm. You know, mm. I think that, I don't think it really had to do with consolidation. I think it was just entertaining stuff in a very successful uh, for a very successful firm. 
So, um, all right, I have to ask, particularly given what's happening in AI right now, and AI is obviously still nascent, although much hyped. I personally think that there's gonna, we're gonna realize in five or 10 years that there was more speculation than productivity um, at this moment, but that's a topic for another panel and perhaps another conference. Um, but I, I'm curious, I mean, Bill Gates has explicitly said, um, gave a talk, uh, gave an interview, I think, to CNBC in uh, 2019 saying that, um, the antitrust litigation prevented Microsoft from competing effectively with Google, and yet here we are uh, at this moment with Microsoft being one of the big four and competing very well with Google. Um, what do we think about that? Let's just go down the line, Gary. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we didn't kill the company, not by any stretch of the imagination. We made a competitive market in which Microsoft can compete. And going forward into AI, maybe the antitrust focus is going to be Microsoft because of their investment and because of some other things going on that I really can't talk about yet. Uh, but but uh, uh, touche, I guess I would say. Ron, so I would say um, you know if you want to if you want to talk about phone, uh, I think you know clearly uh, Google destroyed Microsoft in, in terms of Windows Phone. If you want to talk about music. You know, the Zune was a complete failure. Um, and in terms of, of whether they're competing right now, I, I don't see them, at, I don't consider them as, as competition to Google in the desktop world, because like I said, the desktop doesn't matter anymore. And the browser, uh, Microsoft has been destroyed by Google as well. So um, I, I don't agree that, that, they're, that they're one of the big four in those areas. I think on the server side, Microsoft is finally, in, the first, in my opinion, for the first time in my life, uh, Microsoft is innovating somewhere. Um, so that they are uh, one, one of the big companies in terms of, of server, you know, competing against Amazon, competing against Google. Um, but you know, in the areas where that have to do with this particular antitrust case we're talking about, uh, I, I don't see it that way. Bob? Well, the, the question is what, you know, how they compete against, against Google. I mean, one of the things that came up in the case, and I'm sorry to go back to it, was the importance of placement on the desktop. Um, on Windows machines these days, Edge is the default browser. And if you get an update to your operating system, you get Edge as the default browser. Microsoft has still got 70 to 80% of the desktop top operating systems. They have a 13% share in browsers. People just switch to Chrome. And it's insofar as search engines go, the number one uh, search outcome on Bing, what do you think it is? Google. Google. It's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable <laughs> thing. I mean, that part about distribution and confusion and all this, it turned out to be nonsense. But, it, the, but the, the other operative point there is that the, the thing that they're marketing in so, in so far as, as a browser and a search engine isn't competing well against Google, and the better product is probably winning out. Can I just add? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I also want, about the phone, about Windows Phone. I've heard it said today and, and other places that it was because of the antitrust case that Google failed. I'm sorry, that Microsoft failed in Microsoft Phone. But um, you know, anyone who's used the product knows that it just wasn't a good product. You know, if you want to compare it, I mean, it had no app ecosystem. It, it just didn't work compared to the to the competing product. Um, I think uh, we're going to, in a couple minutes, go to questions. But let me just ask you, what would have happened, just as a thought experiment, if there had been a vertical breakup? Any thoughts on that? Bad things. <laughs> Gary, go ahead. Bad, he said bad things. What do you, or sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, because of how Microsoft acted after they were chastened, I don't know that we would have been better off with a vertical breakup in that particular case. Um, but, you know, vertical breakups can happen and can work. Uh, it's just that we didn't need one because of how it turned out. You want to have a quick word there? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's important to understand that uh, the, the vertical breakup, there was another part that would have been a horizontal breakup, um, was to, to spin off the applications and have an app applications uh, company and then an operating system company. But the, 
the applications and the operating system are complements. And one of the things that's not realized, this is the way these other, all these other cases come together, the way Microsoft exceed, succeeded in the places where they made good products was they made decent products and they, they charged incredibly low prices for them compared to the competition. John Scully of Apple uh, testified that they actually considered going to the, the Microsoft system of, uh, of being vertically di disintegrated with respect to, to uh, OEMs and stuff and licensing their operating system. And they said, well, we could license the operating system for 75 bucks. But if we did that, we would have to sell 10 times as many computers in order to break even. And this was at a time when Microsoft, remember I said $75. That's way less than what they, the implicit price they were getting for their Apple machines. And uh, they, they had figured they had no hope of selling 10 times as much. And at that time, Microsoft was charging less than half of that for a combination of DOS and Windows. The reason they came, now this comes back to the applications, the reason they became dominant in applications really isn't anti-competitive conduct. There were some accusations of that. But as, as one of the te uh, witnesses for Lotus testified, you know, we're, it's incredibly hard to compete against these guys because they make good products and they charge incredibly low prices. Okay. If I were allowed here with my slides to come in, <laughs> I could show you the prices of applications and operating systems, okay. that how they declined over time. So they basically took their monopoly power, if you will, and they realized it in quantity rather than in price. Prices were falling. Okay, I'm um, gonna open up for questions. Tim, why don't we start with you? Is there a mic or you can just shout? I think they, don't they want it for the... Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Thanks. I, I suspect in the room there's a lot of people interested in this. Uh, I have. I wanted to make a comment first on the on the question about the vertical um, breakup. I'm surprised no one on the panel suggested that. Even though I agree, we got some, some supervision of of, of uh, Microsoft. That you might have had increased competition with the basic Office suite, you know, with Word and Excel. I mean, they're not the best products in the world, but nobody wants to get directly on, no one wants to get on the operating system trying to compete with them, because I feel it's a sucker's game. So, you know, that I just want to comment that that, mm. you, uh, the Windows operating system is kind of in a, a death zone for anyone trying to launch new companies for, for a long time, and I think maybe that was a lost thing, even though I agree there was some things. But I have a question for uh, for Ron. Um, uh, you know, first of all, I to say that when, you said you programmed on the IBM 360. I started saying, how old is this dude? <laughs> but then I realized you did that when you were nine years old, if I'm not mistaken. You looked me up, okay. Yeah, yeah I did look you up. So, uh, but I, what I wanted to know, uh, you know, you, you talked a lot about how you were, guys were very focused, technical committee, on, uh, you know, the operating system and, and brow other browsers and how they were treated. Uh, did you also, and if you said this, I'm sorry, focus on how Explorer, which I think had about a 95% market share by O2, treated the various websites or applications on it you know because that seems to me ended up being the key the key site of competition so so the answer is not directly yeah so um when when we looked at what google was doing with chrome at that time and, and to some extent mozilla's netscape that it was on the way out um you know we we looked at the the capabilities that chrome was allowed to have on the Windows operating system more than what Explorer was doing. So it's sort of indirectly because there were standards committees talking about what browsers would be allowed to do. And Google was pushing for much more feature-rich functionality in the browser, and Microsoft was not. Um, so it, to, that, to that extent, yes, indirectly, because by allowing competing browsers to come in and have more of a say by their market share of what the standards committees cared about, uh, that that's how we addressed it. Can I can I just make a comment on uh, the mandate of, of of the committee was very narrow from my perspective, very narrow. And I want to say Harry Saul has been a longtime personal friend. Uh, you recall that the Netscape matter started when Bill Gates sent his minions down and attempted to divide the market with Netscape, and then Netscape said no, so he brought down his wrath on them. I had that very same situation with another client, a household name or product you guys still use every day. 
and I went to the committee and said, they're doing the same damn thing. And, and they talked for a while, and Harry said, you know, Gary, that, I mean, that's really important. You need to convince the government to bring another antitrust case. Hmm. And I'm like, man, it was 10 years of my life, you know. <laughs> Maybe so I, I, because Harry's a friend, I, I mean, I used to go around talking about how I didn't like the remedy and it didn't work. I don't do that anymore because, because he's a friend. But th there were problems that the remedy didn't solve. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add to that. I mean, it, certainly we, we had some, some limitations in what we could address. But, you know, I'm a technologist. I only care about the furtherance of, of innovation. So in the long run, to me, um, that goal was achieved. OK. So, let's, so can, I, uh, can I just comment Very quickly, and then I want to get some more questions. Yes, I understand what you were saying. And I think it's important that Chrome, for example, or Google wanted more functionality in the APIs, let us say, than Microsoft wanted in those APIs. And the consent decree said that, that Microsoft has to reveal, if you will, all of the APIs that are used in their middleware uh, uh, software. So re technically you're saying they would be in compliance with that even though what the other guys wanted was more functionality. Is that right? It's a little, it's a little more subtle than that because it's not APIs I'm talking about. I'm talking about the external to Microsoft, the standards committees that determine what HTML was, yeah. what HTML5 would have. Um, so it's not really APIs that I'm talking about. We, we did a lot of monitoring of making sure that Microsoft revealed or allowed access to APIs. But what I'm really talking about is the, is the feature, the actual features of HTML and, and the World Wide Web. OK, okay um, David. Thank you. Um, there was a lot of talk in this panel about, uh, you know, why was the Microsoft trial a spectacle and how, why didn't the Google trial add up? And as a journalist, I want to defend kind of my profession here. <laughs> the Google trial was a secret. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were like four people in the room for the entire trial, and, and most of them are here. It, it, <laughs> it, it took Leah, you know, protesting in the middle of the trial to the judge to actually get some more information out of that courtroom. So I think it's the success of your experience that led Google to know that the court of public opinion was a bad place for them to be. And so, I, I mean, this is not your father's monopoly. And, and, and I, I think that needs to be recognized. That's a great point, David. Well, well can said. Can I just, can I make one quick comment on that? Yeah, I agree. I was chatting with Leah last night about that as well. And I do agree with that. However, the frenzy coming into the trial in Microsoft was so great that the judge could not have done what the Google judge did for weeks. And, and that's one big difference. That's such a, Luke, go ahead. Interesting point. Remember that um, the judge did bring in journalists and was reprimanded for it and was taken off the case upon remand for judicial misconduct. He didn't bring them into the trial. He brought them into his office before he even announced his decision. Okay, um, go ahead. And I mean, just to piggyback on what David just said, it, I think one of the, I think Google you know, absorb those lessons of Microsoft in, in the 90s and early 2000s by, they, they basically bought the circuit, a circus. I mean, DC is just a Truman show of Google shills. And so, I mean, that that helps if for decades they are kind of running interference. They've got sock puppets that are just saying, throwing water on the importance of a case or, or uh, kind of flooding the zone. Um, my question was for Ron, your name came up in a, a, a conference that I, uh, hosted a couple months ago called Remedy Fest, where we were kind of reflecting on some of the past, but also looking to the future of imagining, you know, what what if uh, there's an adverse ruling against Google, uh, as expected? What if there's an adverse ruling against Apple? Uh, what what is the DMA going to look like, you know, a year from now? And I'm just like curious about all the details of of your experience. Like, how much did these people get paid? Uh, kind of as as a, you know, your team of ninety plus folks, could, 
could you offer them competitive salaries? Because I'm just trying to even imagine today the environment of how would you even structure this? Mm. And then if you have any any general thoughts, like, you know, sort of an explain like in five simplified sort of takeaway uh, that makes you more uh, inclined to support something like structural separation or a more um, uh, maybe a, a cleaner uh, remedy as a result of your Microsoft experience as we look at Google and as we look at Apple? Great question. Yeah, I mean, it, it was expensive. I, I think that, um, you know, if, if we could not pay above market rates, we would not have been able to get the people who we got. So we did pay above market rates. Um, the uh, One of the interesting facts about the final judgments is that um, Microsoft had to be, had to pay the bills, all of our bills. So we were a corporation. Um, a, you know, a separate corporation, but every year uh, we would send an eight-digit number to Microsoft and, and say, you have 30 days to wire this into our account uh, without any supporting detail. But, but you know, the, the, the government looked at it and, and, and sort of approved it, thought it was okay. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of the future, I think when you have high-tech uh, cases that require some sort of remedy and oversight, to not have highly technical people doing it would... It would be a mistake. Um, we, we've seen it in the past. We've seen, um, you know, you know, lawyers and judges are smart people, right? But that doesn't mean that they understand down to the bit level like our people did. And that was without that, we would not have been able to to make the final judgment actually be complied with. Okay. Question over here. Uh, in the front, is there a mic? Yeah, thanks. So this is a question, I guess, maybe maybe for Ron, but maybe the other panelists will be interested as well. So, I, you know, um, this is coming a little bit from the European side, where there was the Microsoft case. I was involved with it on the commission side of it. Um, but it was very closely related, I think, to some elements of the final judgment in the appeals court. And that's basically on interoperability. Mm -hmm. uh, and the case actually is very relevant for many of the other cases that we are discussing you know, in more recent times, because the, the underlying economics of this is that a concern that you know, a monopolist has access to a certain source, um, the operating system for Windows is a monopoly product, or it could be other things when we think about you know, Apple or some of the other, other more recent monopolists. And in order to get access to that, in Microsoft's case, the operating system, you have to interoperate with it. Otherwise, it's very hard to sell your products. Um, the, the, if Microsoft, in this case, limits that interoperability, it's harder for rivals to build up market share in this alternative market. And then the worry is not necessarily just the alternative market, it's building up a new, a new, kind of com a new product which could eventually become a threat to the platform. So that's the underlying question. So how do you deal with that? And I think you know, what Guy was describing was the attempt to kind of create interoperability to force Microsoft to release sufficient information, which goes on the, beyond, well beyond the API, to let these rivals interconnect. Now, my understanding is that it's extremely difficult to do that. I wasn't sure where you landed. You seem to land in a more optimistic place mm -hmm. than many other people have. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because of course the alternatives, you can't, if, you, if it's difficult to do that, you have to think of a more, you know, structural, structural approach. So, you know, could you elucidate yeah. a bit more on what works and what doesn't work? And did it work in that case? Yeah. And could mm -hmm. it work in future cases? Yeah, I think what you're talking about in the US case was Section 3E, which I, which I spoke about earlier, which is the communications protocols. And uh, the government's idea was, you know, we, we make the documentation for these communi communication protocols available. You can have competitors with competing servers that could talk to the desktop monopoly that's out there. Um, and, I, and I was lucky to, uh, halfway through my tenure till the end, we met with the EC on a pretty regular basis. The, the problem with that was, because of our protective order, we could not tell the EC what we found that was not in compliance. The EC could tell us what they found, but they're about four years behind us. But everything that they found, instead of just complaining about it, they started fining Microsoft to the tune of a million euros per month, I think, or day. Actually, it was a million euros per day. And, and the things that we had been trying to get fixed for years suddenly got fixed very quickly. So that, <laughs> I think, is a, is a pretty interesting part of this case, that we didn't have this kind of the stick that the, that the EC had. 
But um, in terms of how I feel about it, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds. I think that that you know after filing like 10,000 bug reports against the documentation per month, you know we and and, and writing a lot of the documentation our, ourselves as the as the judge as Judge uh, Cola Cotelli put, um, we had a set of documentation for the protocols that were required that were mostly accurate and, and complete. So now whether that was useful or not in the, in the economy is, is a different question. And, and, and Carl Shapiro's uh, paper in, in that respect, I think, is, is, is mostly correct, that it, it ended up not making that much of a difference. But uh, in terms of what I care about, which is you know, innovation in the broader sense of technology, uh, I think okay. the rest of it did. OK. Uh, Filippo, you have a question? I wanted to com compliment John's question and get something to get back to something that Gary said in the beginning, which I think is very important as, as we discuss counterfactual. So would you all agree that in the absence of the antitrust settlement and antitrust law more broadly, there was nothing legal or technical that would just stop Microsoft from closing interoperability and not allowing Chrome, Chrome from existing at all? Basically saying, like, we're not going to have Chrome. No, we're going to have just one browser in Windows, and it's going to be only the Internet Explorer. So that would be the counterfactual of no antitrust laws, right? So anything legal or technical that would say, OK, no, the, the Chrome would have existed anyway. Uh, I'm going to invoke a, a slightly different case to answer your question. I represented uh, PeopleSoft uh, when Oracle did a hostile acquisition. And, uh, and the Justice Department Republican administration tried to block the acquisition. So Oracle put on Larry Ellison, who is the great innovator, CEO of Oracle, billionaire. And on cross-examination, the government said, if you had no competition, would you continue to invest? Long pause in the courtroom. <laughs> and he said, no, it would be wasteful. So I think that that's how people with a monopoly think about things. You know, if they could close everything off, why the hell wouldn't they? Yeah, I, I'll, I can only answer from a technical standpoint. And, and obviously, there's nothing technical that could have stopped them from blocking Chrome. Well, if they, if they were going to do that, I could write the code. You know, it would be if name equals Google, then crash. But you know, but they they didn't even do that to Netscape, as I understand it, before the case was brought. I think Barksdale testified that Netscape ran fine on Windows. They tried to affect things via distribution by charging a low price and investing in their product. The distribution ones were were most of them were found to be anti-competitive, but the the others were not. But in the absence of antitrust law, do you see anything? Yeah, because they built, you know, as, as uh, what's his name, Judge Jackson put it, and this number varied from one page to the next, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. There were 70,000 apps on, on Windows, which was supposed to be the, the application's barrier to entry. And so they, they didn't make a practice of saying, ooh, that's a good idea. We're going to block that one and make one of our own. Okay, they tried to compete. So when they couldn't get into it, they made money. I mean, I didn't mean, don't mean they made a bunch of money. They created money. And one of the things that did for them is it caused Intuit to cut the price of Quicken, which dri drives their platform forward. So they, they don't have a big incentive to just cut off useful apps. You know, under, people are going to say, look, OK, that's your operating system. Well, well, we'll go somewhere else. And they could go somewhere else. OK, yeah, I, final thought, and then I want to have a flash quick. round. Frankly, no offense, that's ridiculous. I mean, look at the case against Meta. The whole case is they found the apps that worked the best. They trashed them, and they did the same thing and made a lot more money. All the monopolists do that. It's not just Microsoft. It's not okay. just trashing and crashing, right? It's also not allowing those applications to access the infrastructure that they need that, that their product had. Right. And that's and what this is really case. about. That's, oh. that's the hidden APIs argument. OK, so we're at time. So I'm going to end by asking you guys just to give advice to the current brain trust, as someone was saying earlier, Khan, Cantor, you know, the folks that are embroiled in the current cases. What should they take? 
from Microsoft. Um, final thoughts very quickly in a minute or so. Bob, why don't you start? It's obviously a difficult question, but um, I think the, uh, and this came up in some of the discussion this morning, I think the government's uh, proposal for structural remedies, both horizontal and vertical, were several bridges too far, and they would have been incredibly destructive. I thought the Court of Appeals usefully introduced adult supervision on the anti-competitive conduct. And so, and I think it actually reduces the credibility of antitrust policy. I think antitrust policy is extremely important, but it reduces the credibility of that policy when we go too far, when we become zealots rather than just enforcers of the law. Okay, Ron? Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to talking to Jonathan Cantor here. I mean, I don't know, I think all of you must know that he was counsel for Microsoft during, during my time of the remedy. So. Um, I, it's, I'm interested in hearing how that story came about, but you know, to me, it's 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 about the remedy. To the extent there is a remedy and, and and some sort of monitorship, again, I would just say to make sure highly technical people are involved, whoever, whoever they are. Okay, final word to you, Gary. Uh, so we had two sayings in Silicon Valley while the Microsoft case was going on as a general remedy. The first was the trial is the remedy. That has turned out not to be the case in the Google situation. But our second saying was just keep on suing them. <laughs> that's the best remedy. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's a good place to stop. Thank you all.